So we are talking about tools and platforms for async communication. We get the question all the time. <laughs> what tools do you use for asynchronous? Which should we stay away from? Which should we lean into? The problem is the tool is half of it. The behavior is the other half. And so it's important to talk about that when talking about async communication, because email can just become a slot machine if you're responding to threads constantly and it's more efficient to pick up the phone synchronously. So why don't we walk through what each one is very high level, how do we use them and why we use it. So some of the tools that we use are Threads, Loom, Notion, and Mailman. Notion. It's been there the longest. It holds the most long-term documentation of the company. So all of our memos, our strategy, anything long form or short form process docs that's meant to last. We also have some media pieces in there. So like our directory of podcasts, our team directory with everyone's profile and user guides. So we use Notion in a lot of different ways. At other companies, the nearest thing would be Google Docs or Google Spreadsheet is kind of where the work often happens. We don't lean into those as much. We really use Notion for the documentation and the project management sides. Let's go into external for a sec of like, well, how do we use it externally? We share the docs externally, like let's say with prospective candidates or the general public, something like our compensation philosophy is a public doc or project docs, right? So that becomes the collaboration space. And it doesn't mean for back and forth communication. It just means for being able to share line items about the initiatives being undertaken for the project so that everybody is aware. Where it gets really slippery is like all platforms allow some form of communication. Like we're very intentional about not communicating on certain platforms in certain ways um, because that's where things can get really muddy and really lost. And then you're looking for something that doesn't even exist. Right. So Notion, we don't really communicate in Notion. It's more just like a repository of information. Sure, there's some comments and there's discussion that happens in long form, but it's not an interactive communication platform. So Notion is the foundation. On top of that, we're starting to get into communication mediums. We have Threads, which is probably one of the most heavily used platforms today. This is where a lot of the daily interaction and conversations are happening. It's not uncommon to link to a Notion memo from a thread. It's organized by forums or by DMs and messages are sent to groups of people and we do this for a bunch of reasons that we outlined in the principles of effective communication doc, fewer silos, more transparency, searchability, access, all these kinds of things. Bump up one level. In threads, we can respond in text, so in the written word, but sometimes you want to convey more emotion or just like explain something that's hard to put words to, that's a little bit more amorphous on the edges. And that's where we use a tool called Loom. And Loom lets you record your screen as well as, you know, your talking head with some audio to talk someone through the message that you'd like to send. All right. This is an overview of our digital media strategy. So you can share your screen. We also use Loom in process docs and it's kind of how it started, which is like, here Here's how I update this spreadsheet. Let me record this for posterity. But now we also use Loom as a communication medium as well. There are also audio messages. We can record audio and just send a voice clip without the video piece. If you're mobile or on the go, that's a good way to kind of send a quick message or thought. Adding to, we use Loom a ton externally for context. Somebody will email a really long email and then we'll respond with, here's your answer. And this is where we're getting into synchronous comms, getting into comms that are external to the company. And that's when we would use email uh, and the tools that we use associated with email, superhuman and, and mailman. So mailman doesn't have kind of broad adoption across the team, but people have used it in different spurts here and there through onboarding or just as an experiment for a few weeks. Uh, and what mailman basically does is it batches delivery of your emails in two set times. And so everyone knows that habit where you're like, you just pull out your phone and you're instinctively tap your email to see what's new and whatever it might be. With Mailman, you set up a few times a day, whatever you want them to be, 8, 12, 3, and 5. It delivers all those emails in mass at once so that you can go in after and just process them in bulk. We've tried this out as a trial to give people a sense of batching their email, getting into the habit of not just constantly doing email in the background, but doing it as a set time, as something on your calendar where you're like, this is my communications time and this is when I'm going to do it. Mailman helps reinforce that behavior. Yeah, because that leads into distractions, right? And so the heuristic we use is minimize distraction, focus on deep work. That's really the value. And so one of the ways we maintain this principle of being async is making sure notifications are tuned to minimize distraction altogether. Go on, do not disturb or turn off 
text messages appearing on desktop. Make sure you don't have banners popping up for your email every time you get it, <laughs> like a new email coming in. Yep. And, and we also have trust in the system that if something is urgent, there is a way to reach people, which is pick up the phone and call them, send them a text message. Uh, that's the bat signal generally to say like, this is urgent, you probably need to see this sooner. It might not even be urgent, just might be time sensitive. And so we have trust in the system that there's a hot wire that we can access if we need it. But otherwise, I'll do the work when I want to do the work, not when it chooses to, to display itself in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. This also relies heavily on culture. You know, if you're sending an email on a Sunday night, you maybe should schedule it for Monday morning so you don't send the wrong message about when you are doing work and when you expect work to be done by the receiver. Um, mm -hmm. We don't really subscribe to this. We say, do your work when you do your work and other people do the work when they do their work. When it's sent doesn't carry any subliminal messaging about when we would like you to read it or what the expectation is. And so... We said that pretty clearly up front, but it is very awkward for people to remember that. It's also really hard too, because everybody on the receiving end has a different way of viewing communication. There's not a hard and fast rule because everybody interprets communication differently. It's sort of like how much communication debt are you able to carry cognitively in your brain without it occupying real estate for free? We also use Zoom for synchronous video conversations. And one thing that we started doing is recording everything internally, other than like the odd one-on-one. -on -one. This is personal where everyone's gonna have their own personal level of comfort and it's not prescriptive. It's if you are having a synchronous meeting, you have to record it and make it accessible to the team because there could be important uh, conversations. And it's so much more expensive to get people up to speed and say like, oh, we talked about this thing. It's easier to just say, hey, at minute 1734, Ms. and I talked about bringing on a community manager. Anyone have thoughts? And it doesn't mean that you have to upload every meeting. It's that if you ever need to pull that information back, it's so helpful. Recording by default has made a big difference because yes, the mm -hmm. button's always there and you can click it and we can tell people and encourage that them to record all their meetings, but having it be on by default has made a big difference because you don't have to think about it. It's there. The recording gets emailed to you afterwards. You throw it in a limit, distribute it. Yeah. And we do it with candidate conversations too, because it really allows us to get up to speed in a way that's not possible. So if you are the next person in line to interview or to have a conversation with somebody, you can get up to speed by taking a 30 minute interview and watching it on 2X and you get a download. You don't have to talk to Ms. and like Ms.'s feedback is like, I had a great conversation with Jimmy. Like, <laughs> That's not that helpful. It doesn't help Jimmy. It doesn't help the team. It doesn't help anyone. So that's one thing is it actually helps the candidate. Yep. There are things that have to happen privately between a candidate and an interviewer. And there's a lot that doesn't have to. And so when you step into an interview and say, so cash me up, what have you been speaking about with the last four people you spoke to? You waste 45 minutes just getting up to speed on what they know instead of starting from a point where like that information is known and you can go much deeper beyond that. Yeah, there is no human that is robotic and can pull up every word perfectly with the sentiment and the delivery of the way something occurred with recall. Even if we took a sync call and I gave you all these perfect notes, it's never going to be perfect. It's a lot easier for you to see something where objectively it's like, this is what was said in the interview. That's somewhat of the point of recording and recording candidate conversations or even internal team conversations. This helps the rest of us understand why we're approaching something a certain way. I think we've resolved all of the outstanding questions that I had. Any other uh, questions you had from the, from the doc? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I'm happy with this. It solves all my issues. So when we talk about minimizing distraction, notifications, uh, async platforms, all these things, they really tie into the one thing that we focus on, which is deep work. Meaning, even if you've got mailman on your emails, if you have a tendency or you allow yourself to go into threads, like I'm just gonna check, then you're not adhering to everything that we try to do, which is asynchronous work. So it's back on the person to carve out time for deep work, but then actually execute against that. Yeah, it's important to touch on the why, right? Why are we stressing inbox zero? Why are we batching our email? Why are we focusing on deep work? Um, one, it's that the work quality is better when we're less distracted. The other is just like to make more time for life, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. It's not about getting through your inbox so that like you can do more work and do more work and do more work. We're big proponents of living balanced lives. We want people to spend time with their family, to enjoy their hobbies, to engage in their community. and 
being effective and efficient with your time at work is the best way to do that. So this isn't all just like a means to working more, but it's really like with the right intention in mind, which is let's let people live their lives, time box work to when it belongs, make sure that things are taken care of if they are urgent, but otherwise control your time, own your day, and do what you want with your time.